Good morning on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. You're listening to a live broadcast from Luther Memorial Church in Pierre. Luther Memorial is located at the corner of Nickel and Prospect, just west of the State Capitol Building. Today's radio broadcast is sponsored by the Luther Memorial Church Bell Choir in honor of Karen Zakai. The minister here at Luther Memorial is Senior Pastor Craig Wexler. Today's organist is Linda Steele. Hymn numbers this morning will be 533, 512, 679, and 547. Our worship service will be beginning, will be beginning soon, and our opening hymn will be Open Now Thy Gates of Beauty, number 533 in the ELW Red Hymnal. Thank you, Linda. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. We're awake. Amen. There we go. Uh, glad, to, glad to have all of you guys here in worship this morning. Just a couple quick announcements. Uh, first of all, I give thanks for our church leadership and council leadership who has stepped up uh, this year and has filled in on some gaps when I've had to be absent. Uh, last night, uh, Kim Ferris preached and Kelly Nelson and Andrea Clark did all the liturgy and and it was, uh, I'm grateful in the opportunities uh, that, uh, that they came forward, and it's always fun to, uh, to take lay leaders 
and help them be comfortable in the role up here because the church is the people, amen? Amen. And so my, uh, my special thanks and gratitude to them for allowing me to be over in Minnesota. My aunt passed away about a month ago, and, and uh, my cousin asked me if I would come and do the honors of laying my aunt to rest. So that was, uh, I was grateful for that opportunity, and I say thanks to them for helping uh, in a pinch so that I could get away. Um, with that uh, as a segue, uh, I also want to share with each of you to hold the Curry family in prayer. Uh, Monty Curry did pass away uh, late Friday evening, and so he, uh, he is a saint of saints, certainly, and he and Kit are reunited again, but hold the family in prayer, and there will be information coming in the days and weeks ahead as to when there will be a service, but I want to share that with you guys. Uh, and lastly, believe it or not, I mean, Vacation Bible School is almost here, and I know that a number of people have signed up to help, and Kelly and I are grateful for that. Um, she's always looking for a few extras that are always willing to be uh, on point, ready to go and help in and jump in any different capacity that you can. So if you are still interested in helping out, she certainly would take more volunteers um, in all capacities. So um, that, and by the way, and if you have kids that have not been signed up yet, but you are interested, reach out to her, shoot her an email, a phone call this week. Uh, get on the list. Of course, we do always have families notoriously come in the very last minute, literally, as, as it's starting. But if you have the intention of being a part of that and you haven't signed up yet, please do, because that helps with her planning with supplies and arts and crafts and snacks and all of the good things that come with child ministry, so children ministry. Um, with that being said, I invite those who are able to please rise. Let us begin worship as we always do, confessing our sin and receiving the promise of forgiveness. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. We begin with a moment of silence to reflect. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and therefore by his authority, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is Open Now, Thy Gates of Beauty, number 533 in a red hymnal. Thank you.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is a feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And honor, blessing, and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and joy. for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. For the Lamb who was slain has begun His reign. Alleluia. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. Let us join together in our prayer of the day. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy. Live according to it and grow in faith and hope and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with this morning's readings. The first reading is from Isaiah 55, 10 through 13. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. 
and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial and for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. <clears throat> the Psalm 65, 1 through 13, please read responsibly. You are to be praised, O God, in Zion. To you shall vows be fulfilled. Our sins are stronger than we are, but you blot out our transgressions. Happy, Happy are they whom you choose to draw out to your courts. Glory. They, they will be satisfied, satisfied by the beauty of your houses, by the holiness of your temple. Awesome things will show you, us in your righteousness. O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the oceans far away. You may You still the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the clamor of the peoples. Those who dwell at the end of the earth will tremble at the marvelous signs. You make, make the dawn and the dust sing for joy. You visit the earth and water it abundantly. You make it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. You prepare the grain, for you so provide for us the earth. Smooth out the ridges. With every rain, you soften the ground and bless us and increase. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths overflow with plenty. And it is a wilderness be rich with grazing, and the hills be clothed with joy. May the meadows cover themselves with flocks, and the valleys cloak themselves with grain. Let them shout for joy and sing. Second reading is from Matthew 13, 1 through 9, verses 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some of the seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as far as what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case hundredfold, in another sixty, and another thirty. Here ends the reading of the word. Please stand for the Alleluia verse. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternity. comes to us today from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. 
By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemns sin in the flesh so that the, re- the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live in accordance with the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The parable of the sower, or the parable of the soils, as some of the Bible translations call it, comes together today in our text. And of course, it is set parallel right there with our Romans text as well. And so, therefore, we find ourselves asking deep down inside, what then shall we do? What then shall we do? At our Tuesday morning men's group, uh, we we read through that parable of the soil, and I asked the gentleman, I said, guys, I said, we have different actors, different characters going on in this parable. We have the sower, we have the seed, we have the soil, we have what comes from the soil. And then I asked, what is it, or who is it that we are in the parable? And most of the guys said, well, well, the the seed, you know, the the seed, because the different seed is going to come up in different ways based on faith and this and the other. I said, wrong. We are the soil. The seed is God's what? Word. And the sower is generous. Almost so generous where uh, we, we, uh, the, the conservative farmers in the, in the communities that we live in might ask them ourselves, um, you know, seed is cash. How dare we just sow it wherever? I mean, there is a very specific way in which we ought to do this. And to that we give great thanks that God is generous with his seed. Amen? Amen. But if we are the soil, then we understand the parable to a point in which we realize, ah, the good soil is properly tilled, properly nourished, properly fertilized, spread thick with manure, which is also known as, well, we keep it G-rated. Amen? And we find ourselves thinking, as we hear this parable, we're like, okay, So I understand that the good soil is what's going to grow, that's where faithfulness comes, and I'm going to be happy, healthy, and well. My family is going to be happy, healthy, and well. And then deep down inside in our minds, we think to ourselves as we sit in the pews, what must I do then to become that good soil? And that is where our Lutheran theology goes completely out the window. Because last I checked, soil is dirt that sits there until something is acted upon it. Amen? Soil is just soil. The dirt, if you go out into the fields, if you drive by on your way out to Hayes or on your way out to Blunt and Oneida, you're going to go past acres upon acres upon acres of soil, and that soil just sits. Rain falls upon it, God willing. It is tilled in the capacities in which God tills it, or which the farmer comes in and stirs it. And now, of course, we don't even like to stir the soil to help mitigate erosion, so now we inject the seed into it. The parable just goes on and on and on. And I argue that I think we miss it time and again. We go back to Paul's reading in Romans. And Romans, I think, is Romans chapter 8, the beginning of chapter 8, really is the perfect parallel to this parable of the soil. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. If we are the soil, 
In our minds, we want to say, my soil, I as the soil, am either going to bring life or bring death. And the fact that we continuously debate in ourselves, debate in our hearts, debate with one another as to who is good soil, what it takes to be good soil, continuously actually leads us back into the ways of the flesh, which as Paul speaks to, is death. The last couple of weeks, we've been working through Romans, chapter 6, chapter 7, and we were talking about how chapter 6 is where we find out that we are not shackled to the flesh, we are not shackled to our sin, but we should give thanks for our dependence and our shackling, our enslavement to God and God alone. And then last week, we got into talking about this debate of what does it mean to be in the flesh, what does it mean to be in the Spirit? And we talked about time and again, as Paul speaks in chapter 7, he says, he, he really wrestles with the conscience of our minds. If I know what it means to be good soil, then I know what it takes to be good soil, and I want to do that, I want to be the good soil, I want to do what it takes to make me provi- produce good, uh, good seed, but in order for me to do that, I find myself caught in my sin nature. My sin nature makes me do that which I hate. And we went around and around and around, and we gave some examples of how we in human nature go around and around and how that is expressed in our lives. Jesus ends almost every parable by saying this, those who have ears to hear, listen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you that have ears to hear, listen. You are not condemned because you live in the spirit of Christ. Maybe we should just end there, amen? (laughs) But pastor, we can't end there because if I say I have the spirit of Christ, I give thanks for that, but Yet at the same time, I I find myself thrusting back into chapter 7 where I wrestle with my faith. I I wrestle with that of the flesh. And Paul continues on. He says, "For For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. As St. Augustine once said, grace was given so that the law could be fulfilled and that should thrust us back into the good soil of the original Garden of Eden. In the beginning, when God created all things, It was so incredibly good. In fact, when Adam was created, when all of God's creation was created, we didn't need law. There wasn't law. There was God's creation, and it cycled in the capacity in which it cycled, and all was well. But when humanity fell away from God, when sin enters into the picture, God gives law so that we can have bounds put back on us to prevent us from hurting others, but even more importantly, to help us prevent us from hurting ourselves. Amen? And that law is what we continuously wrestle with day in and day out. Last week I talked about the enemy's playbook was the sermon's title. We talked about how the enemy functions and how he places us, sets us apart, but not only sets us apart from one another, but most oftenly, our number one enemy is who? Ourselves, right? Again, God gives law as gift to prevent us from hurting others, but to help us prevent from hurting ourselves. And day in and day out, we press those boundaries of that law. And it's not to say that we long to live in the flesh. It's oftentimes we long, we long to live in the spirit, but the flesh continuously comes upon us, and it comes in our conscience, it comes in our worries, it comes in our desires, it comes in our actions. Fleshly emotions, fleshly behaviors, fleshly actions and decisions equal death, is what Paul is saying. 
When Paul speaks of living in the flesh, we often think that we, we often think that what Paul is referring to is simply just our actions. What do I do with my bodies? What do I say with my mouth? What Paul is speaking is he's talking about the every absolute physical capacity of ourselves, including the mind. And my, do we battle with the flesh day in and day out. I remember years ago when I was in seminary, part of my educational experience was to serve as a chaplain in a hospital setting, and and I had the gift of serving in a Vera Behavioral Health System. I was able to be the chaplain at the mental hospital in Sioux Falls. I will tell you, the gift of that is it was never, ever boring. Never. It was a phenomenal experience of witnessing brothers and sisters in Christ, really wrestle with the flesh, with the mind, with the capacities of this world. When that time came to an end and I was sitting there in in what we call candidacy, which uh, which is a fancy word for being sponsored and approved by the synod to, uh, to say whether or not you are fit to serve as a leader in the church, You can graduate all day long, but if you don't have uh, support of the Synod, you're not going to be ordained. And when I was sitting there in my, what they call, endorsement interview, those on the interview panel, they said, you know, Pastor Craig, well, sorry, it wasn't Pastor yet, we weren't ordained. Craig, student Craig, there are very few that have had the opportunity to be in the mental health uh, facility as, as as all the time you did. What is the biggest thing you learned? And they were genuinely curious, because none of them, some of them were retired pastors themselves, none of them had served in a capacity like that, and they wanted to know, what is the biggest thing you learned? And I said this, I think it was kind of a godly answer, it was a spirit answer, I said, 90% of the patients I worked with are absolutely clinically sane. The vast majority of them absolutely battle anxiety and depression. And if that's 90% of the patients, I found myself wondering, and this is part of my answer, I said, I wonder what it takes for any of us to end up in a situation needing that care. Fascinating. Because in our time, in our culture, we think that mental health is lumped on the extreme cases. The extreme cases that only Hollywood and TV would make a very real possibility. Well, I'm here to say that 90% of everyone I dealt with is dealing with anxiety and depression. And what is the anxiety that we deal with? Anxiety is all those what-if thoughts. It's all that internal struggle. What if I'm not good enough? What if I don't succeed? What if I cannot provide for my family? What if I don't graduate? What if I don't have the career of my dreams? What if my kids grow up and maybe I fail them and they struggle worse than I did? What if I can't raise my kids so that they are better than I could ever be? What if I lose my job? What if I lose my boat? What if I don't get the the, the house on the end of the block? Fill in the blanks on all of those what-ifs. That is exactly what Paul is speaking to, of being captured in the flesh. Being vulnerable for a moment, the interesting curse that came shortly after I gave that answer to that interview panel. About two months later, I had my first full-blown panic attack in my life. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but any of you that have ever been in the midst of of the throw of an anxiety or panic attack, oh, it's a joy from, we'll just say a joy from hell, amen? And it led to a spiral of chaos. It led to a spiral of those what-ifs. It led to a spiral of further, further dwelling in the flesh. And I remember a dear professor of mine pulled me aside and he said, Craig, he said, apparently I get pulled aside a lot in seminary from professors. Yeah, that was part of the story last week, amen? Pulled me aside and he said, Craig, what's going on? And I said, uh, nothing, Pastor Weisner, why do you ask? And he said, because you haven't been answering questions in class lately. I began to divulge everything that had been happening. He was, we call that confession. And he looked at me and he said, I think you need a little bit of peace, don't you? I said, peace would be good right about now, Pastor. We opened up to Romans 8. And he read these words. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. 
But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Fascinating how many years later this text comes up in another context. Pastor Wisner, he asked me, he said, so Craig, um, what's your prayer life like? I said, well, I pray as I'm walking up to class. I, I pray as I'm sitting down for my meals. And you know, at nighttime, as I'm getting ready, brushing my teeth and getting ready to go to bed, I'm, I'm praying all the time, Pastor Wisner. He goes, no, what you're doing is multitasking, and it sounds like it's not working very well. I never thought of it that way. In fact, my prayer life was becoming more of a duty than a joy, so to speak. He gave me what he called the 30-day challenge. He said, I want you to set that chair right across from you when you wake up in the morning. He said, if you need to set your alarm five minutes early, please do that. He said, I want you to get up. I want you to set that chair across from you. I said, well, who's the chair for, Pastor? And he goes, who do you think? The Lord. He's going to sit there, and you're going to look at him. And you're going to tell him what is ahead for you, or what's on your plate for the day. And you're going to tell him about your struggles, your worries. And he said, and at the end of that prayer, you're going to give it up to the Lord. And then you're going to go on with your day, and you're going to function. And you're going to trust that the Lord is going to provide, and you're going to trust that he's going to give you the mental faculties to make it through the day, in your studies. And he's going to give you opportunities today. He's going to place people in your path that might just mold and shape those prayers in time. He said, at the end of the day, you're going to put that chair back across from you. He said, he said, Craig, are you going to ask me who's in that chair? I said, no, I got it, Pastor. He goes, good. And he said, in that prayer night, or that night of prayer, you're going to give it up to God again. Give him some thanks. Give him some gratitude for the day. He said, think about that day. He said, the struggles, the things you couldn't check off your list, that you didn't make, you didn't accomplish in the day. He said, give that to the Lord, and he's going to give you other times and opportunity to take care of those things, but it's going to be on his watch said, okay. And he said, do you trust me, Craig? And I said, I want to. He said, do this for 30 days, and we're going to check in. And he pulled out his calendar, and exactly 30 days from there, he wrote my name down for the appointment that I was required to graduate, show up. What it did is it reminded me that we have one day at a time. It took away all of the anxiety and the depression of the past, the things that maybe we didn't accomplish, maybe the things that I didn't quite check off the list, even though they were goals and expectations that maybe, quite frankly, I placed more on myself than others placed upon me. What it also did is it helped me bring myself back in and not be too focused on the future, because two and a half months later was the wedding date. My gorgeous wife was going to be walking down that aisle, and, and I was ecstatic, but the, uh, the impression, the thoughts, the worries, the provision, the having the apartment that we were hoping we'd be in, hoping that she'd have a job offer, hoping, you know, we have to survive, amen? And all of those things, I was scattered two months, six months, a year, two years down the road, already in my mind, that was taking shape, and that was living in the flesh, worrying in the flesh. But praying one day at a time in the morning and in the evening brought the focus back to truly the gift of the day. Thirty days later, I sat down with Pastor Wisner, and I swear he just read Romans 8 before each of these meetings. And he said, are you ready to finally have peace? And I said, yes. He goes, well, how was your prayer life? I said it was the most peaceful thing I ever experienced after about 29 days. He goes, it took you 29 days to find peace? And I said, I'm not sure I fully found peace. And then, and then we walked down to the sanctuary, just down the hallway from his office. And we walked into that sanctuary on campus, and we walked over the baptismal font, and I didn't think much of it at the time because we were continuing in this conversation. And he finally started kind of playing around in the water with his hand. And he looked at me, he said, did this happen to you at one point? And I said, well, absolutely. He said, good, because that's kind of a requirement for you to be here. And I said, yeah, that baptism thing. He said, do you remember it? And I said, no. I was a baby. I said, well, 
Did you know that some words were placed upon you when you were that child? And I said, my baptismal promises? And he said, absolutely. He said, did you know that you are in Christ, not in the flesh? And my baptism kind of hit like a ton of bricks. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are the ones hearing God's word given to you. And in God's word, the seed is scattered upon you. And God has promised to till your soil, to give good fruit, to give good life. And Christ has promised to put you at peace. It's my hope that you let the what-ifs of life go. It's my hope that the what-ifs and the debates and the ideologies that we cling to, which are all in the flesh, can be let go. Be at peace. You are in the flesh, or you are in the spirit. Sorry, I almost messed that completely up. I almost botched the whole sermon. You are in the spirit. Paul says this, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, But by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. You will grow in life. You will continue in life. And your flesh, your mortal body, will die. You will succeed in life. And you will fail in life. And you will struggle in life. And you will find great success and joy in life. But all of that will still die. What does not die is Christ's word dwelling in our hearts. What does not die is his promise of the Spirit upon us. I had the blessing last week to go and visit Monty Curry. And he was in a lot of pain. A lot of struggles, trying to recover again from another fallen, broken hip. And it is a testament that no matter what, we, our mortal flesh, does and will perish. But what does not die... What did not die is Monty's spirit, amen? What does not die is our spirit. We must let go of the flesh, which in and of itself is an act of the flesh. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you hear his word, you know his promise, simply believe. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of the day today is... Lord, let my heart be good soil. Number 512. I invite those who are able to please rise. Number 512.
where love can grow and peace is understood. When my heart is hard, break the stone away. When my heart is cold, warm it with the day. When my heart is lost, lead me on your way. Lord, let my Let us profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, our ushers will come around with the offering plates. We will prepare ourselves for prayer and holy communion. You may be seated. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Gracious Lord, we come before you this day. And as we move day by day in our lives, Lord, we find ourselves spinning in toil, Lord, worrying about the ways of the world and, 
And those worries, that anxiety, that, that tension, the emotions that come with it, Lord, they are all expressions of the flesh. But Lord, you have given us your spirit. And we are called to live in your word, trusting in your word, and living and embraced in that spirit, Lord. Give us your peace that surpasses all understanding. Let us know that your spirit is enough. Lord, in your mercy. And gracious God, as we lift up our community, we lift up all of those in need. We continue to lift up those who have lost their homes because of fires and explosions and, and other disasters, Lord. We lift up our farmers and our ranchers, and we lift up all those that work outside, especially as the air is, is thick with smoke, Lord. We, we ask that the fires in Canada be put to rest. We lift up all of, a, all of those in our community, Lord, who continue to prepare themselves for the school year ahead. We lift up the teachers, the nurses, the administrators, and all of those that prepare themselves for that time of education. Lord, in your mercy. And gracious Lord, we lift up all of those on our prayer list and in our hearts and in our minds. We especially lift up Linda Fridley and Ron Winter. And we lift up the kids and all of the extended family of Monty Curry, Lord, in his passing this week. Let them hold on and remind themselves of the promise of your resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. All these prayers we lift up into you, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink. And he said, in this cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. As we gather at this table, let us gather in the prayer our Lord first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, we uh, come into a time of communion. Uh, Julie and Carmen will be our prayer team representatives. As you come through the line, if you would like a special prayer blessing, uh, just uh, approach them and they would gladly do that with you. If you do not want to do that during communion, pull them aside afterwards and they would gladly pray with you for any needs that you might have. Um, also, communion is through, uh, in tink well, we do have the little cups. You will have a piece of bread and then the cup, the red, wine, the red liquid is the wine, the clear liquid is the grape juice. And the, anyone needing the gluten-free option, that is front and center as you come through the line. All are welcome to this table. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. <laughs>
This concludes this Sunday morning's worship service from Luther Memorial Church in Pierre. You can join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. or Saturday evenings at 5.30 for our contemporary service. If you're unable to attend either of these worship services, you are invited to tune in to our live radio broadcast here at 9 a.m. each Sunday morning here on KGFX 1060 a.m. or 103.1 FM. Or just go to drgnews.com and click on Listen Live. Sunday morning services are also live streamed on our LMC Facebook page, and you can catch our sermon podcast on either our LMC Connect tab or right under our website under the Connect tab. Special thanks this morning to the Luther Memorial Church Bell Choir for sponsoring this morning's broadcast in honor of Karen Zakai. Our radio broadcast do rely on financial support from members of Luther Memorial Church and other regular listeners and viewers. If you would like to sponsor a radio broadcast in honor of a special occasion or in memory of a loved one, just contact our church office at 224-8608. So now on behalf of Pastor Craig Wexler and the congregation here at Luther Memorial, we extend our prayers to you and yours for God's care and guidance throughout this coming week. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sending hymn is sent forth by God's blessing, number 547. spirit help others live in the spirit as well go in peace to love and serve the lord thanks amen, amen.